Hi, I had a question about overconsumption. It was listed in one of your panels as being a 5% change we could make, but a lot of times that's the messaging. Um, and so I'm wondering if it's really only 5%, if, if it's only going to help by changing 5%, what's the point of not buying bottled water? I mean, and I'm an advocate for all this stuff anyway, so like, I have to do this messaging, so that's why I'm wondering. But um, what, what do we do about that, and um, where does that fit into this overall message? And um, I don't know that I trust the, market, the, the corporations to make those, those choices for us, and as a consumer, if the only way I can vote with a company is by having the market change them, um, the market will correct itself, but the market only corrects itself if there's no more demand. So that's a very complicated way of asking a very simple thing. I'm going to respond before I turn it over to Mr. Pierce, who can actually answer that question. By, by clarifying a misperception, I did not say I trust corporations. I said I trust them to do the thing that they do best, make money. I'm sorry, you're I do right. not okay. trust them. Yeah, I got to move this forward so we don't feed back to us. I do not trust them to make decisions that are good for you, me, and the world. I trust them to make good decisions that are good for the next quarterly report for the shareholders. That's what they do. Don't expect them to do anything else. If you do, you'll be disappointed, or worse. So I want to make that clear. Having said that, now Mr. Pierce will answer your real question. <laughs> yeah, I, I was a bit worried about. I was very worried about that five percent number. Um, I simply don't believe it. It looks like a Monsanto number rather than a WWF number. I've never heard a number like that come under WWF and wouldn't expect it. Yeah, yeah, well, there's, there's politics inside WWF for sure. Um, no, I, you can argue endlessly about those numbers, but, I mean, I think even a, a modest reduction in, say, the meat consumption of the rich world would probably have an effect greater than 5%. Um, obviously, it and sort of getting back to sort of, you know, get, getting rid of the obesity problem around the world would, would probably shave a lot more than 5% off. Now, I, I simply don't believe that number. Uh, but it depends on your um, presumptions behind it. I thought those, all, the, all of those numbers on that graphic, I thought, uh, while it was a good list of, of things to have, I thought the, the, the numbers, as you say, from Jason Clay uh, were uh, pretty... I was going to say heroic, possibly heroically stupid might be better. <laughs> okay, I have to respond. <laughs> All right. Well, of course, as an academic, the beauty of citing someone else's work is I don't necessarily have to defend it. Uh, on the other hand, what I can tell you is that those are the tools in our toolbox. The, we can quibble about the percentages, the proportions. What happens in the next 40 years will prove out what those numbers are. But those are the tools in our toolbox. I don't know of any other tools in the toolbox besides those. There are all sorts of reasons to reduce consumption, all sorts of heuristic, ethical, economic, as well as, frankly, ecological reasons to reduce consumption. Um, and so that should be, we should do that for all those reasons. I don't believe in monometric approaches. I don't believe in simple solutions to complex problems. That often leads to just more complex problems. What I like to see is that we understand how the, our impact on our ecosystem in which we live. Now, the problem is that we all live in a world that's global. Our impact is global now. That just means we have to understand more, and that means you have a tougher job to educate your kids that they need to understand all of those impacts. Everything's connected. I guess I just want to comment a little bit, not to defend the 5% number, but rather defend the idea of what if something is just a 5% effect. And that's that there is no silver bullet here, and we want to make all of these changes, and all of these changes add up. And by making one small 5% change and being aware of that, that person might be a little bit more likely to do a second different change that's 5%, and a third change, and a fourth change. And all of these start adding up, because there isn't a single solution anyways, so they're going to have to do more than one thing. And it is very much about the decisions we make as people, individuals. Certainly there are a lot of things that can be made up at a higher level, but what we're doing as individuals, and often those seem like small numbers, but they all add up. Um, I was curious, Mr. Matlock, about you said that um, the Cherokee Nation manages their own water. 
in that area. I'm, w I'm wondering if there's anything interesting that's happening with the management of the water there that you could speak of. We just, we just received July of 2009 federal, a federal court ruling that gave us authority over the autonomy of our water. We've been fighting. We've been in Oklahoma since 1835. Uh, so that's, that sovereignty debate has just been resol resolved at the federal court level. We've been managing our water resources indirectly. We're now going to manage them directly. I'm an environmental protection commissioner in the, for the, for the uh, government of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, we're, we have policies in place that are very similar to federal policies. But really what we recognize is that management of the natural resource means that we have to understand local issues over national issues first. Um, so w prosperity is our focus, pros and prosperity for us is directly tied to uh, ecosystem services to biodiversity. So our first goal is simply to restore the biodiversity of the region. We're losing critical endangered species by the day. We've inventoried those. The state of Oklahoma, I'm an eighth generation Oki. The state of Oklahoma has done nothing in the last 40 years to reduce that direction. As a government, we cannot rely on state, federal governments to solve our problems in these critical local issues. We have to own these problems and solutions. And that's what we're doing. Could I, could I just add, add in a question on that? If you now own the water rights legally, uh, are you going to start selling them? That's a fair question because our southern tribes, southern sibling tribes, are the Choctaw, the, the, the Comanche, some others, are under pressure to sell them to the Dallas to Tarrant water, County Water District, which is in uh, the Dallas, Texas, a very thirsty city. Uh, and so the, the question is, should we do that? The Cherokee Nation speaks, I'll speak for the Cherokee Nation because I know the position of the Cherokee Nation. I won't speak for the other tribes. The Cherokee Nation believes that the sovereignty, it's, it's a cliche, but it's one of those cliches that actually has some truth to it. We believe that water is the earth's blood. Uh, it's, a, it's an old sort of common sort of uh, 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 tribal cultural myth or a, a sort of similar vision of, of, how, of water as the body. And we all, and it's so you don't sell your blood. You just don't do it only unless you're desperate and it's uh, for, for money and it's payday next Friday and you got to go get plasma, right? We don't do that. Uh, this is it's it's a it's a religious sacred trust uh, as, as much as anything else. So no, we will not be engaged in that. But we but again, we're only borrowing the water because it's passing through our lands. It comes to us by rain and from upstream and it passes through. So we're part of a larger, more connected system of which we have to be good citizens. Um, for decades in my life, um, I've heard of cloud seeding, controlling rain. I think this is a question for Dr. Martin. I think the Chinese tried it recently. Is this something that will never work? You know, there's great power if you can control this. I don't know if I really want to control, but what do you know? What's the latest scoop on cloud seeding and creating rain where you want it? I'm, it's not my expertise, but I know that the cloud seeding has not been scientifically demonstrated. Sometimes they seed the clouds and it rains. Um, maybe it would have rained anyways, and that's the problem. It's very difficult to do any sort of controlled experiments um, to formulate a hypothesis and test that hypothesis with cloud seeding. So actually here at the University of Chicago many years back, um, one of the people who were the first among the cloud seeders were here doing work, but um, it really has not gone any further than the, the idea that it was decades ago that, yes, sometimes it works, <laughs> but there's no scientific basis to it, at least at this point. I, I don't disagree with any of that, but the Chinese are spending very large amounts of money doing it um, and do make claims uh, and some Chinese cities complain because if one Chinese city during a drought seeds the cloud and gets some rain and, and Chinese cities downwind don't get the rain, uh, they get very angry about it. So there's a perception that something is going on here. Uh, the Russians also seem to be doing it um, on a significant scale. Um, the Israelis claim to have had success doing it and the Jordanians claim that the Israelis have had success doing it because they didn't get the rain. So, I mean, all this does get very political. Um, my gut feeling is that the Chinese are not stupid and that they, if they didn't think it was working at some level, they wouldn't be spending the very large amounts of money that they are spending doing it. Uh, I haven't seen any Chinese 
academic papers demonstrating the success. And as you say, it is very difficult um, to to Not sort impossible, of do. But it hasn't yeah, but it, it's. I mean, over the years, various scientific attempts have been made to uh, assess whether it works, um, and they have. Uh, as Pam says, kind of generally reached or not being able to conclude that it does, but that is not the same as concluding that it doesn't, if you take my point. But my suspicion is that it works sometimes, but you probably don't know quite where and when. But you have a good point, and that's that they're, it's literally just taking the water from one place that would have ended up someplace else. So it comes down to that same idea of a water cycle that's balanced, that we have just so much of this, and it's either going to come out here or come out there. Now, there could be advantages to one place to the other, um, but it definitely will open up a whole new set of problems if that is pursued more, I guess. Cloud seeding, and he, he wrote a book on it. Ah. And he did some experiments, and he says the Indian government has to listen to him, and then he can solve the drought conditions in some of the areas where it, he really feels that it works. So uh, this is what he told me in person. Uh, he bought a session like this, and he was one of the panel members. This same question came up as uh, cloud seeding as an alternative uh, to actually have rains in the arid districts of Andhra Pradesh and other various places in the world. So here is a reference for you. I think there is a book written by him. Maybe you can check that one out. Um, Professor Matlock, you ended on kind of a positive note regarding genetic engineering and the kind of the affiliation that Gates Foundation and uh, even World Wild, uh, WWF has with them. What, could you comment on what I think are pretty compelling articles called Failure to Yield from the Union of Concerned Scientists in which it just looks like the GE crop promises haven't uh, come forth? I actually wrote a critique of, the, of that article from the Union of Concerned Scientists because I thought it was a, as a scientist, and I make no apologies, I thought it was a poorly crafted argument as a, a scientific piece of debate simply because... Uh, it, it, it implied a, a hypothesis that was from the beginning false. Genetically modified crops in the United States have been developed and marketed to, in an, in a, for agricultural producers that are already pretty close to optimum yield or maximum yield for a given ecoregion already just to reduce input costs. Not to push yields up because they're, already pretty, they're at very high yields already, but to reduce input costs for a given yield. That is to reduce pre weed pressure predominantly as well as pest pressure. That's what those crops have been developed for because that's where the market is. I'm not, making a, I'm not an apologist for Monsanto, Syngenta, Bayer, any of the, the GM companies. I'm simply arguing that as a logical argument to say that, well, GM doesn't work to increase yield is not a logical argument when the GM crops that have been developed and marketed were, were marketed largely to reduce input costs for crops that are pretty high yielding anyway because the United States our mechanized agricultural systems for a given region, our yields are pretty close to their optimal yield. Does that make sense? It's maybe a little subtle from a, uh, but it just, it, now the question is can we yield, increase yield? If, if, we, if we're producing 20 tons of, to of corn in Nebraska per hectare, 20 metric tons per, per, of corn in Nebraska per hectare, and we're producing two tons per hectare in Malawi, if we take that two tons and increase it to four, what's the relative impact versus taking 20, to, 20 tons and increasing it to 22? You see, same relative increase in yield, two metric tons per hectare, but you doubled it in Malawi. That's where we should be focusing, and that's where genetic, genetic modification, which has not been, there's not been a market incentive for that because these are poor folk. They can't pay for this stuff. And these are companies, remember my first premise about companies? They do what's in their best interest economically. They have an economic interest in developing these drought-resistant varieties that yield better, but the, real human the, the indirect benefit for humanity will be because of the opportunity for those places that are very low on the optimum yield scale to increase by large increment. We'll do more good doubling low-yielding crops than incrementally increasing high-yielding crops. I'm not a profit maximizer. 
that's not what I do for a living. I want to reduce human suffering. Just, just yeah, it, there's, there's a real difficulty, with I think, with GMs, because I think the technology does have great potential, but the way it's often used by the agro industry, the agro industry, uh, for their own ends, not necessarily the ends, if you like, that would be more communally useful, um, is often has perverse effects. So it might be sounder to, 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 to see the, the potential benefits from GM crops without giving a blank check to those companies that are currently developing because you know, they're, they're not necessarily developing the, uh, the kinds of traits that would be most useful for, for the wider world rather than for their own bottom line. So, I mean, if you, if you as, as they do, are developing crops that allow you to use much less pesticide on your fields, that is a real benefit. Um, if you, you know, if you're a cotton farmer in India and, you know, thousands and thousands of cotton farmers in India die of pesticide poisoning every year, if they can use a, a cotton crop or any other crop which is resistant to the pests that were killed by that pesticide and therefore they don't need to use that pesticide anymore... Surely that has a range of human and environmental benefits, and I would be very reluctant to say that developing that crop was a bad idea. Similarly, if you can develop crops which have improved yields in, uh, um, in, in low-yield farming areas, perhaps through better drought resistance, you are you're having a range of effects. You are protecting, potentially protecting people against against drought and potentially against famine. You may be protecting ecosystems that would otherwise be destroyed in order to extend agriculture to produce the food that's necessary. So all those are potential gains in the same way as I would defend the Green Revolution of the 1960s and 1970s because whatever its downside, it fed the world and it stopped the world having to destroy most of the rainforests in order to do it by just extending farming. Similarly, there are benefits here. The trick, the problem, is to how to manage, how to control what is done, how to have public accountability for what is done, uh, for the kind of research that's pursued, the kind, uh, the kind of regulatory controls to ensure that there aren't environmental or other downsides. Um, and perhaps almost more than anything else, not to, not to, if you like, squeeze out poor marginal farmers because they can't afford the seeds. Or, in other words, there are a whole series of political and economic and regulatory issues which are real and important, but I don't think... Uh, that they undermine the case that, that, that GMs could be valuable. They're not a silver bullet that's going to solve all farming's problems, but they are potentially a useful tool. Sorry, that's a rather long answer, but I mean, I think don't, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You need to add, though, in the environmental risks that are in there that are unknown. So on one sure. hand, you know, you, that's a big unknown right now. I think if we can get some way of quantifying that and understanding it and controlling it to do some then it makes sense. But right now, yes, we have be benefits, but what, you know, what are we weighing those against? And that's really poorly defined right now. I, yeah, I think there are very serious issues about um, genetic pollution. So, for instance, uh, maize corn crops in, you know, in their heartlands in Mexico, uh, if you're introducing GM maize uh, into those regions you're going to get genetic pollution. What effect is that going to have on the traditional varieties? I mean, there are, yes, there are a whole series of issues. And the problem is, or one of the problems, is that the corporate sector gets so powerful, and if you like, the arm lock that it has by saying we can improve yields and we can you know, improve drought tolerance and all that stuff, they put an arm lock on the policymakers, which stops sensible policy-making decisions being made. So, as I say, I think it's a, a lot of it's about government, it's about regulation, it's about accountability. And um, those very big corporations, and we know the names, um, are very good at riding roughshod over that for their, at any rate, short-term uh, benefit. It comes back to some of the things that we were saying earlier about the, the morals or other lack of them of, of corporations. Not to put too fine a point on it, but to the environmental risk issue, I mean, ecologists, one of the, and it's a central concern. There are environmental risks for everything we do. Certainly, there are environmental risks for genetically modified organisms, especially transgenics. And there are things we oughtn't do that are just patently dumb from the outset. Using 
uh, using uh, uh, resistance to antibiotics as a genetic marker for something that you care about in a plant. That's just kind of dumb from the beginning. And the guy who did, or gal who did that ought to get thumped upside the head. Uh, those are the sorts of dumb things we do sometimes in, in the academy and the sciences. But I can tell you that we have fairly high certainty what will happen to our ecosystem if we don't do something different than we're doing now, which is it will be eradicated. All ecosystem services that we, are, that we depend on are fundamentally at risk. So we have to do something different than we're doing now. I'm not, I can't prescribe what that something is, but I think, that the, I think the World Wildlife Fund's approach, the tools they've identified, are reasonable tools to begin with. Under, with a recognition that we've got to be transparent, we've got to monitor, we've got to assess, and we've got to revisit. We have to be engaged, and your students have to understand this complexity. We can't defer. I think that's the central message here. We cannot defer. And I think that's a really important point to bring up to your students as you're having this debate. If you are talking about GM plants and the ecological risks, and um, we hear people complaining that some people have adverse reactions to right, the GM products that they eat that maybe they're not used to, the changes that are in those products, but then, you know, to end on that note after you have that debate in terms of, well, something has to be done and do the risks out, you know, do the benefits outweigh the risks and, and how so. so. I mean, sorry, just to add one thing. I mean, I think the, the kind of discussion we're having is, is, is absolutely a discussion that you can have in the classroom. It's not so... Um, the danger in a lot of these debates is that people uh, if, if, sort of try and pay science, sort of science, some scientific trump card. Ah, but I, but I know something that you don't. And actually, at root, a lot of these issues are just about the straightforward things that we're talking about here, balance, balancing risks. And that's something which, you know, you could do in the classroom. You d don't, don't be seduced by the sort of cult of the, of the, of the expert. This is not really about experts. It's about, it's about you know, citizenship. One of the uh, risks I just want to mention is uh, allergies because these uh, plants are related. Potatoes and tomatoes are cousins, that kind of stuff. And you can increase the allergy uh, rate in the population when you mix cousins. That's why I'm mentioning that that's the only thing as a biologist that I would see would be a problem. Well, well something is increasing the allergy rates in the population right now, and we don't know what it is. So I agree you could. Um, and what is required, I think, is, is here, actually, maybe this is where the cult of the expert needs to come in to just try and find out what the hell it is, uh, as well as, obviously, heading off uh, uh, future problems. But if we knew what was causing the increase in the allergy right now, we'd, we'd probably have a, a better handle on what to do in future. How many of you guys have classroom gardens? Tisk, 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 <laughs> tisk. It should be mandatory. Oh, but we have testing criteria that don't allow us to allow our students to go out and actually grow crap. So they eat crap because they can't grow it, because they don't know how to grow it, because you don't have, because they don't grow it in their homes. There's not a single balcony on the, in, in the city of Chicago or in your hometown that can't grow enough fresh vegetables and herbs to supplement a standard diet. It doesn't take that much. The old Victory Garden concept works. The Michael Pollan notion that we ought to grow our own stuff is a simple, simple concept. Why don't you ignore a section of that standardized test performance requirement and actually have the students go out and do something in their, in their classroom? I'm being critical. I'm sorry. But they need to learn to grow things because in learning to grow things, they understand how things grow. And they understand a little bit more about their food supply and its robustness. And they understand the difference in the taste in a real tomato and that thing you buy in the store. And they understand also that sometimes things don't, things have spots on them that are still okay to eat. Those are things that the students need to learn. I'd like to bounce off what you said. Uh, I'm in a K through 12 school, and this year our senior class gave each one of our divisions a hoop garden, and I'll be in charge of it. The problem we have in schools is our growing season is September to June, so you know the hoop garden's going to solve the problem. In January, we can grow beets and carrots and spinach, cold weather crops, but I'm very excited for the reason you said. Kids will know, you know, get some sense, that connection you talk about, what goes in their mouth and where it comes from.
little earlier, um, a couple different people had mentioned something about the Gulf Coast, and I've been doing my own research um, originally on Hurricane Katrina, and so now sort of adding in the, the whole oil disaster on the wetlands. And I know that wasn't our main focus, but it seemed like nobody else was asking a question. The microphone was right here, so um, I wondered if we could maybe have a conversation about this, because the issue, when I went down to New Orleans in um, March, I learned much more about how devastated the wetlands already were. And then they were saying maybe possibly 20 years before they're going to be destroyed. And that was before the oil disaster. So as soon as that hit, my, my heart just dropped um, because I had months before been sort of more conscious of now the imminent um, destruction of the communities, the ecosystem, the economy. And a lot of the people that I've been looking at had been indigenous communities south of the city. So it, again, it's very, very interconnected, <laughs> all of these pieces. And so I'm trying to, there's not really a question in there, but maybe other people could just kind of speak to this, because I think it's probably the, the critical issue, certainly on my mind, I think a lot of people these days. So. A lot of folks say this is the worst ecological disaster in, in American history. They forget the Great Depression era Dust Bowl, which was an agroecosystem disaster, human made exacerbated by decadal drought, which resulted in the displacement of hundreds of thousands of my uh, grandparents, neighbors, and family. Uh, and my daughter's reading for ninth grade, Grapes of Wrath. Those of you who are ninth grade teachers know. Uh, right now, John Steinbeck's sort of epic tale of, of, of the, the impact of that agroecosystem agro failure. What the Gulf Coast is experiencing is a man-made man ecosystem failure not on the level of the Dust Bowl. And we'll have that kind of compounding impact economically as well as ecologically. Now, what emerged from the United States after the Dust Bowl was the Soil Conservation Service, now the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the implementation of conservation agriculture, which is now which, where we slingshot it out of uh, basically scraping weeds out of dust into uh, one of the more productive agroecosystems agro on the planet. That's a good news story in some respects. That was a response to of government, local, state, federal, and mostly individuals to learning a lesson about our dependence on ecosystem processes. Perhaps, perhaps we are as smart as our grandparents were. Perhaps we can learn those lessons too, perhaps. Yeah, you, you, you raised a number of issues. Just, just to respond on the Dust Bowl, of course, one consequence of the Dust Bowl was that people started tapping the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, you know, there, there are some perverse consequences when you do good things, and I wouldn't say that it was wrong to have started to do that, but nevertheless. Um, on wetlands, roughly half the world's wetlands have already been destroyed by one means or another, not necessarily pollution, but principally by draining and um, extension of farming. Uh, we've destroyed as many of the world's wetlands as we've destroyed the world's rainforests, and they're arguably at least as important uh, ecologically and in terms of biodiversity uh, and everything else, but we talk much less about wetlands. Wetlands are a critically endangered resource. Um, but I think I'd put a bit of perspective on, on what's been, and I'm not just because I'm a Brit and it's British Petroleum and all that, but I'd put a bit of, I'd put a bit of perspective on, on what's happened down there. Um, there is another huge ecological disaster which has been going on in the Gulf of Mexico for a while, which is something they call the dead zone, which is all the uh, runoff from fertilizer for the whole Mississippi Delta system coming down into the Gulf of Mexico, so fertilizing the, 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 the marine algae there that they bloom such an extent that when they die, and they, which they do after a few weeks, they consume all the oxygen. Even before the, you know, nothing to do with the oil, every year very large areas of the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico have been completely dead. We don't hear much about that because it doesn't touch the, um, the, 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 the shore uh, wetlands. Uh, and everybody in the context of BP was talking about, well, when it hits the land, it, you know, that oil's done a lot of dom damage out to sea. Um, but, uh, okay, well, that's... Another pers perspective I would put on it just to show that I'm not being parochial Brit is the 
ecological disaster out in the Gulf of Mexico and on those wetlands is as nothing compared to the ecological disaster caused by oil companies in the Niger Delta in Nigeria with huge ecological and much greater social consequences to, to the extent that there's effectively a civil war going on down there over, over what the oil companies have been doing. And the oil company involved there is Shell, another British oil company. I'll stop there. I guess I just don't want to answer it but address the idea, and that's you named several different environmental problems before it was hit most recently with this. And it brings up the question of something my graduate students really interested in, and that's the resilience of an environment. And the idea that our coastlines and other certain environments are just being battered. And they're already in this state with the dead zone of, of you know, a non-natural state where maybe without the compounded three problems, they would be a more resilient ecosystem. But now that we've had these multiple problems stacking up on it, um, what, what's going to happen? And I think that, you know, that is going to exasperate the problems of recovery. I mean, uh, Katrina recovery was exasperated by the dead zone. Um, all of these things fit together. Um, and on the other hand, if we can look forward to a positive thing like some solutions to the agriculture problem and addressing you know, our needs in different ways and become more aware of the ecosystem services and really think about what the ecosystem provides and take into account that we can establish or reestablish more resilient ecosystems than when we do have man-made disasters like this or natural disasters, we could be in a better place for recovery for them. Oh, and just to ratchet, ratchet up the politics a bit, um, the Indian government still has um, an extradition request out for the chairman of Union Carbide, responsible for the Bhopal disaster, which um, killed thousands of people, uh, and uh, again rather puts a bit of perspective on what's happening in the Gulf. Um, I we don't reckon he's going anytime soon. We had talked earlier about the enormous amounts of water to grow cotton and rice and alfalfa for three examples. Um, what do you propose should be enforced in different governments to sort of alleviate those issues with those particular crops? Do you think that there should be regulations put on by government? Yeah. I, I don't. I, I work with environmental regulations my, my entire career. Rarely are they effective at their desired outcomes. Oftentimes, they, they're brute force methods. You're doing surgery with a sledgehammer with regulations. There are times when you need regulations to set the floor for behavior, and nothing there below that shall be allowed. That's appropriate for pollution. That's appropriate for safety. That's appropriate for other things. But for agriculture producers, uh, what we, have, we should have is rational policy for water resources that... Uh, that allows for the appropriate valuation of the resource and then allow p local communities to make decisions on the best how to allocate those resources based upon their own value structure, economics, uh, because they'll be the ones pay paying the price. Otherwise, what will happen is the regulations, as always, will be co-opted by the powerful because that's what happens uh, in, in governments. The power co-ops. And so th th it's just it's not a process that I... Uh, I'm, I grew up uh, in the 70s, 80s, listening to stories about the American Fruit Company co-opting resources in Central America. Of course, uh, all you have to do is watch uh, uh, Johnny Depp movies to understand about East India companies and its ability to co-opt resources. That's the, that's the way you end up with, that's what regulations end up doing, is they end up serving power. And so that's why I, I don't trust that. What I trust are rational markets that are uncoerced and that are transparent. And then I trust people to make good decisions. Yeah, I think with cotton, there's a bit of a problem with that, I think, in that it very, in most countries where cotton is a large industry and has a large ecological effect, it is sustained and more or less developed by governments. I mean, without the government of Uzbekistan determining that industry, there would be no large cotton industry destroying the Aral Sea. Uh, without the government of Pakistan 
um, allocating water supplies, there would be no huge cotton industry in arid Pakistan. These industries um, are usually on such a scale that they are, if not initiated, fundamentally underpinned by government policies. So I think at that point you can't sort of back off and say, well, you know, let the market... Uh, you know, let's have rational market decisions. It's a profoundly irrational, unmarket system to start with. Well, what you just you just described the phenomena I would fear, which was that is that that, that those are policies that are put in place that have the consequence of uh, eradicating a fundamental resource necessary for the for the, the economy and causing human suffering and, uh, to boot, as well as ecological destruction. That was a conscious policy designed for a purpose. Um, policies, big writ policies are very difficult to implement in a, in a rational way without those sorts of unintended consequences. So you're going to have policies to support and underpin cotton growing and then policies to suppress cotton growing in the same, you see, uh, at, at this point, remove the bad positive influence and perhaps let markets work. You just described a phenomena that is that I would want to avoid. I would say you'd have, you can let markets work, but you need to have some incentives in there, and you need to be building in um, these externalities, or what are considered ex externalities now of energy, um, greenhouse gases, the water, obviously, biodiversity, all of this. So, you know, there is there could be a role for government in the sense that we're investing billions in agriculture now to bolster cotton growing and to bolster um, corn and soy and even taking it as bad as that was to start with taking it out of its natural rotation um, because of these subsidies. Why not take some of those subsidies and rather than just allocating them based on market, allocate them based on the ecosystem services? That's, that's, you, you know, that's the right. idea. So it's, it's, but right. there is a role then for government into helping to push this. NRCS know? is supposed to be developing ecosystem services incentive program for agriculture to pay producers to enhance right. ecosystem services, sort of what, like we've been doing for conservation lands exactly. and other things yes. in the United States. What I would argue is that there is one big, big influence that's more powerful than all governments in the world, and that's the, that's the power of the consumer. And, what, and mm -hmm. consumer choices are starting to matter. Informed, transparent consumer choices matter dramatically to major box stores and to their suppliers, the people who sell the, to the major box stores, which would be about 80 percent of consumer goods. So what that means is consumer packaged goods companies are very concerned about what the citizens think about them and their brand and their company, and they're very concerned about you thinking ill of them. They don't necessarily want you to think of them as green. They don't want you, as long as you don't think of them as brown. <laughs> if you think of them as green, that's even better. But they recognize that you're probably not going to buy their product versus another product that's a proportion cheaper because they're green and the other product isn't. But if you think of them as not green, then you may buy the other product just because. So they're very con conscientious about that. The value of you, the consumer, the value of having people write books to describe what those companies are doing, transparency, the value, yes, there you go, transparency and the value of knowledge and the consumer and the consumer's decision making is among the most powerful forces from humanity's perspective on the planet. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say the same thing, and I think we don't often get change without outcry, and, and we're very privileged to be able to read these books and, and hear these talks, but there's a lot of people around the world that have no idea how much water goes into the food and beverage that they're consuming, and that's part of the challenge, and I think really the important part of you all being here to talk to your students about this, about, you know, why do their actions matter? You know, why do these individual actions matter? And then... If, if we are to take it a step further and, and do these sort of inner school projects um, that we could potentially in a couple of years take outside the boundaries of the United States and talk to students in other countries to do similar projects and, and talk about these issues, um, it's really raising awareness of how much water goes into these crops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can, can I, I, did a point. I, I, I agree absolutely with what you say. The power of the consumer is, is it's, it's the only thing that really scares corporations. Corporations can handle governments. They can buy them off. They can uh, lobby them. You know, they, they know how to handle them. Consumers, much harder to handle it. If, you, if you've got a groundswell of opposition to your brand, to your company, you're in serious trouble, and they know it. So consumers are really powerful. One problem with the cotton industry is it's very, very difficult to find out where cotton in your clothing comes from. I mentioned um, Bangladesh. Um, and how most of the cotton there comes from um, uh, Central Asia and destroying the Aral Sea. It was immensely difficult to find that out. 
Um, you talk to gr growers around the world, they literally don't know who, who, where their cotton is going, what clothes it's going into, where it, it gets turned into clothes. You talk to the retailers, and they told me, and I do believe them, that they didn't know where their cotton came from. There are these big combines, Cargill and others, the big commodity traders who basically t buy all this stuff up and put it in one big pot and then sell it on. And nobody, it's quite convenient for some people, but nobody knows exactly where that cotton is coming from. Um, and there are a number of other commodities that, that fall into that category. That makes it quite difficult to pin the blame on individual brands that we know about. But I think it would be really useful if people did. As a classroom exercise, I think it would be fascinating. I read a book called, um, why I explored this, I read a book earlier called Confessions of an Eco Sinner, which is basically trying to find out where the stuff that I buy comes from and what the environmental footprint and the social footprint of it all was. And it was, um, I think that's something which classes could do. Try to pick a few products, pick a few things that you know, a lot of people are, are wearing or, or eat or whatever it is, or brand of coffee or whatever. Try to find out where that comes from. And it, sometimes it's really hard. As I say, the cotton case is very hard. Sometimes it's rather easier. But whatever, I think you find out quite a lot about the social implications of buying that stuff and the ecological implications of buying that stuff. And, you know, as a sort of project, it would take a little bit of time writing off to people and so on. But as a project for a class, I think it would be fascinating and really quite revealing about the environment, um, about global resources, about the, the global economy, if you like. It just basically how stuff happens. Um, I'd, I'd recommend that. Certainly for journalists can do it. Any, you know, students can do it, you know. I actually have a quick question regarding um, regulations as well as agriculture. We've been hearing a lot recently about um, energy independence and moving towards ethanol derived from agriculture. What effect does this have um, throughout the world? I've read also about these pine oil plantations and soy plantations in developing countries around the world as well as corn grown here in the U.S. Um, and I know the U.S. government has a, a pretty hefty target of like 20% ethanol by like 2020 or something. How does that affect the, the way water is used throughout the world, and are we, trying to, are we shooting ourselves in the foot while trying to solve our energy problem? Not in the foot, in the head. Um, <laughs> cause, yeah, the, I have a general bumper sticker response for that. Food for fuel is foolish. It's that simple. Uh, we, there are, are other ways to generate biofuels that do not compete with the food supply. Uh, Having said that, I recognize that there are no simple answers to complex problems. Our fuel supply is a complex problem. What our, what our agro-industries and regulatory communities and governments are doing is understanding that we have to build a, a bio-based infrastructure in order to move from petrochemical dependency to a bio-based economy, and that the easiest politically low-hanging fruit, no pun intended, is corn because we do generate excess corn and it increases the, we subsidize the corn market in many ways uh, in order to ensure that it's profitable so that we have it for our own natural, uh, national defense among other reasons. So we, it's a profitable crop. The downside of that is you get the 19, or the 2008 uh, sort of crunch and you see just how tight the supply chains are and suddenly you start pulling on the string and every other knot on the planet starts, market on the planet starts shifting around and you have food riots, and you have other issues that emerge. Add that with, a, with a, a series of droughts or other disruptions of production and yield, and suddenly our markets are in chaos. That's the danger. So I understand that, that we're on a very complex, tedious pathway to go from where we are to a biofuel-based economy, and it's going to take 50, 75 years, because, frankly, oil's too darn cheap already still. Even at 200 bucks a barrel is still too cheap to really move us that way. Uh, so that... Yes, it's foolish, but it's a necessary foolish stage for us to go through so that we have the infrastructure in place to process, to distribute. It has to be decentralized. Yeah, I think what happened uh, with the first generation of biofuels is pretty crazy. I mean, as, as Lester Brown, the environmentalist, says, and I, I have no reason to disbelieve him, that the, if, you're, if you fill a, an SUV tank with, uh, with bioethanol, that requires as much corn as it takes to feed an African for a year. 
So we're talking, you know, we're talking serious amounts here. And if it, it, as I understand it, roughly 20% of the U.S. corn harvest a year or so ago was going into biofuels already, something which kind of happened almost from a standing start. Um, I also understood that the, the push to do that had quite a lot to do with lobbying from, um, I, I could name it but I won't, but one of the big um, commodity traders who was really quite keen to push up the price of, uh, price of corn and was spectacularly successful in doing that. So, um, you know, there are, there are a number of issues floating around here. I do, as a kind of a little bit of a sort of closet techno-optimist, I do think there is potential with second-generation biofuels which don't require, which don't basically take land or large amounts of water from growing food. Um, and now that could be done using agricultural waste, um, it could be done using algae. There's quite a lot of interesting technology using algae, which you can grow in, in sort of tanks or even in the oceans to develop biofuels. Um, where are we going with biofuels? My gut feeling is that, um, is that our automobiles won't be running on biofuels um, in 20 years' time. They'll probably be running on electricity, and the question then is how you generate the electricity. Um, but I can see a role for biofuels in something like aircraft, you, you know, you, you can't plug a 747 into the mains, uh, you know, every, every 100 kilometers, every 100 miles or so, you know. There are certain uses for which biofuels might be really handy, and I suspect that aircraft may be one of them. Um, so let's not write it off, but it, um, the idea of the whole world's transport fleet running on biofuels, I think, is pretty fanciful, and that probably really would lead to billions of people dying of hunger. Well, I know the focus is on water, but we can't really just think about water when you're talking about biofuels, and you really need to think about it as all of the environmental impacts. The first-generation fuels may or may not be coming out ahead um, on energy, depending on who you talk with or which paper you read. It's pretty clear they're not coming out ahead in terms of greenhouse gases. One of the reasons we turn to biofuels, if you do the entire biofuel balance for ethanol, it's a loser. It's adding more greenhouse gases than we are averting through the whole life cycle. So it just doesn't make sense on so many different, you know, in so many different arenas within the environment. Um, but that said, there, the second generation, there may be, um, there, there, there likely will be some hope for things like some switchgrasses or um, where they could be providing other ecosystem functions um, while they're being, before they're being harvested as a biofuel. So. It doesn't, you know, there is a, a place for it, but I think we acted much too quickly or the, the, um, with the ethanol. You cited the, um, the directive by DOE or DOD to increase the amount of biofuels to some level. At the same time and for the same target date, the EPA set a level of reducing the size of the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. It is impossible to meet both of those goals, given any available technology. Um, it's, it, you cannot do it. By having all of that grain, you're going to be increasing nitrogen runoff and some phosphorus runoff and hydrologic changes to the cycle. All of those together are what form this dead zone. So you're going to grow the grain, and you're going to grow the dead zone. You can shrink the dead zone. You need to get rid of some of that grain. Except I'll, I'll offer one of the grand ironies of the Gulf oil disaster, yeah. which is what we're doing is in, once, once the volatiles, the toxics wave or evaporate or are biodegraded, what we have left are the longer, medium, and long-chain oil molecules that are relatively uh, high-quality <laughs> food for the bacteria. <laughs> But those bacteria, as you should be teaching your students, all living things require oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and you go down the list of micronutrients. They're going to, they have lots of carbon now because that's what the oil is. They don't have much oxygen. That's why they're sucking up all the oxygen and creating the dead zone. Well, let's say we give them oxygen, and that seems to be what's emerging as the most viable te technology is, to, is just to oxygenate the heck out of the Gulf Coastal Fringe on those ecosystems that matter most, so high energy input oxygenation. So let's say we do that. They're going to be nitrogen deficient very quickly. Ah, well, thank goodness we have all that nitrogen coming down the Gulf of Mexico or the Mississippi River to feed them. So we may be inducing a phosphorus limitation next. We may have to fertilize the near shore waters with phosphorus in order to fully metabolize all that carbon. Again, we're only riding on this planet. It holds the the, uh, the sardonic key, and it's a fairly uh, how would you? Say? It's it's an ironic experience. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists one last time. <laughs>